Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you for making the time uh, to attend this um, research report launch on the findings from a study on the situation and experiences of domestic violence as experienced by ethnic minority and immigrant women uh, in Hong Kong um, with a comparative component as well. The focus of the study was essentially to undertake a comprehensive uh, and qualitative approach to understanding the experiences and particularly the help-seeking patterns uh, among ethnic minority and immigrant uh, women who were victims of domestic violence in Hong Kong, um, and to compare that with the experiences of similar women um, in the United Kingdom, uh, given the similarities between the legal um, and social welfare regimes uh, in the two countries. Um, the analysis is framed in terms of Hong Kong's, uh, the Hong Kong government's obligations uh, under the CEDAW and the obligations to deliver equal protection under law, law to all people, regardless of their race, religion, ethnic background, uh, and other status, including, for example, immigration um, and the like. The findings reveal, um, sadly, an institutional and systemic failure and uh, gross inadequacies resulting in this particular group of women falling through uh, what I'm calling the justice gap. I seek to ground the recommendations from the research findings in the context of human rights, uh, and more specifically, women's rights to protection against domestic violence, uh, and all women's rights to equal protection uh, and effective protection against um, such violence under the machinery of the state. Um, so I'll start off by charting out the state's obligations. Uh, the state, which Hong Kong, so Hong Kong is a party to the uh, CEDAW Convention, um, and under the convention, each state has a, uh, an obligation of due diligence to ensure not only that the individual circumstances of violence that are experienced uh, by people from time to time are uh, addressed through the criminal law regime, but also other forms of violence that are perpetrated uh, in the private sphere are also brought to justice uh, under appropriate laws to govern the personal uh, sphere. Moreover, the due diligence framework imposes on states an additional obligation to ensure systemic barriers that lead to the perpetuation of heightened risk of violence are also addressed. So although CEDAW does not expressly mention violence against women, advocates have long relied on the treaty and its provisions as indirectly signaling a call for an end to violence against women. With the focus of CEDAW's articles being on achieving equality and non-discrimination in various spheres of life, particularly civil rights, legal rights, and personality, as well as reproductive rights, the idea was that without freedom from violence, women cannot enjoy these other basic rights um, to equality and non-discrimination. Specifically, Article 5 of the CEDAW singles out the impact of cultural factors, particularly patriarchy, on equality as a systemic barrier to women's enjoyment of their rights. Indeed, through General Recommendation 19, the CEDAW Committee has incorporated violence as a form of discrimination against women in that it inhibits and undermines their enjoyment of their human rights. Additionally, apart from the treaty-related discourse, feminist discourse over the years has underscored the ineffectiveness of legal provisions in achieving equality between the sexes. Feminist critique of legal and institutional frameworks targets multiple levels of discrimination and resistance, ranging from the ideological to the practical. And from a standpoint of substantive women's humans, human rights and their effective protection and enforcement on the ground level in order to drive equality to the forefront of social, political, uh, and legal participation of women. The Declaration on the Elimination of Violence Against Women, which was um, res a resolution as to which was passed in 1993, defines and identifies relevant issues pertaining to violence against women in various manifestations. Article 4, for example, obliges states to condemn such violence by exercising due diligence in their implementation of an adequate framework to prevent, protect, prosecute, punish, and provide reparations against such violence. So you can see that there is a multi-pronged approach that is required, and each stage um, comprises an, uh, an important component of the state's obligation in due diligence. So there is a, uh, a requirement to prevent, to protect, to prosecute, 
punish and then provide reparations for the victim, whether that violence occurs in the public or the private sphere. Article 4 also requires state parties to develop comprehensive strategies, including legal, political, administrative, and cultural measures to protect women against any form of violence. So again, the breadth of the realms in which violence can occur, that's recognized under this declaration, and also the variety of the forms uh, that violence can take um, is also recognized under this declaration. Particularly, Article 4 guards against re-victimization due to the failure of legal and administrative measures. And that is something we see a lot in state parties' efforts. Uh, oftentimes, governments will say that they have measures. They have civil law, they have criminal laws, and machinery in place to protect women. Um, but the enforcement of these laws and the administrative uh, processes and their accessibility for all women uh, sometimes and oftentimes actually undermine the effectiveness of these um, existing uh, mechanisms to redress violence for many women. So that's a general overview of um, the obligation to protect against violence. Specifically, uh, within the rubric of feminist uh, discourse, intersections theory has called into question the one-size-fits-all approach that underscores the framework of many protective um, measures and laws that are currently in place. The application of an intersectional analysis to victims of domestic violence promptly reveals that not all women who are victims are in a position to access existing mechanisms to protect themselves uh, against violence. The effectiveness of frameworks and institutional capacities for protection are predominantly dependent on individual user capacities and, more specifically, their internal cultural response systems. And these cultural response systems, in terms of the way they understand violence, the way they experience violence, and how those around them react to it, these internal cultural factors drive or discourage certain courses of action. The findings will show that women of color and immigrant women and those categorized in other minority statuses um, tend to be most precarious and vulnerable to becoming entrenched in cycles of violence. And general laws fail to adequately protect the interests of all groups of women because violence and responses to violence are culturally constructed. The use of the dominant cultural framework, therefore, to address minority victims' needs entrenches them further into situations of violence by creating this justice gap because they have nowhere to go that suits them. Women are more independent and willing to take requisite steps to seek out protection when their sense of self-confidence and self-concept are high. These circumstances of empowerment can be tailored into the life experiences of minority women so that they have the necessary tools to better understand um, the system and to engage with it. At the same time, however, the system itself also needs to incorporate the lived experiences and realities of ethnic minority women and their circumstances so that they are more likely to behave in a particular manner and seek out the existing um, forms of interventions that are available to help protect them. So the research objectives of the project entailed uh, exploring the lived experiences and user capacities by looking at help-seeking patterns of behavior um, and to identify prevalent measures and interventions that are available uh, in the two jurisdictions and to understand better the accessibility gaps and systemic barriers to service provision. Um, and finally, to recommend, based on those findings, how transformative justice that fulfills the obligations of due diligence and substantive equal protection for all women can be achieved. The aim, essentially, is to try to develop a best practices model looking at interventions developed in countries such as the United Kingdom and Australia. UK we look to because they're well advanced um, ahead of Hong Kong at least, although there are certain um, issues that arise in that context which uh, are highlighted by this study as well. Um, and then Australia has been probably one of the more progressive regimes in dealing with the um, experiences of minority women. And in fact, they don't even call uh, this group of women minority women or ethnic minorities. They simply refer to them as culturally and linguistically diverse um, women. All right, so there's a recognition that there's an inherent need to uh, recognize these women and uh, enhance their accessibility, and that their accessibility is dependent on their cultural and linguistic uh, attributes. 
Apart from user-based capacities then being impacted by cultural framing and language barriers, there is also the additional dimension to the study which sought to understand and examine closely the system uh, itself. Who are the frontline immediate responders um, to violence? Social workers, police officers, service providers, healthcare professionals. Their interventions are framed in accordance with what appears to be most logical and rational to them. However, such frameworks are grounded in assumptions about user capacities, which need to be challenged because they are currently failing victims uh, of domestic violence in general, as we all know, but also more specifically um, failing more seriously this particular group of marginalized women. The methodology uh, of the study was to look at six target groups or stakeholders um, and experts on domestic violence law and policy in each of the jurisdictions examined. Um, service providers, shelters, uh, and NGOs, they are who I'm referring to as service providers. Um, they're Apart from the shelters, the service providers tend not to be specifically designed to deal with victims of domestic violence. They're general service providers providing a range of uh, variety uh, and variety of services to ethnic minority communities. Um, social workers, uh, police officers, healthcare workers, and ethnic minority women victims. Uh, in Hong Kong, these women included mainland Chinese women um, because, as we know, their immigration status and their distinct sort of cultural factors are worth looking into and have been studied by others. So I did include them uh, in the study. Um, but I did not include migrant workers. Um, and apart from the fact that the domestic violence law does not envisage domestic workers as falling within its realm, um, there are also other policy-related um, uh, reasons why they can't fall within um, this dynamic of service provision. But that's not to say that their experiences uh, do not need to be studied. In fact, they need to be very closely examined, particularly because of the um, contractual situation which leaves them vulnerable to uh, and exposed to violence um, in that very intimate sphere. And so in some sense, they share some of the barriers and the problems we see uh, coming out of um, this particular sample of women. I also included in the sampling uh, ethnic minority and immigrant women who did not experience violence, so non-victims. And the, the idea was to try to compare whether there was a difference in terms of the knowledge that they had or their personal attributes or perceptions about violence and what they would do if they experienced violence. So this was to try to provide some kind of comparison, whether victimization itself leads you to think about things differently. Um, the sample was determined largely through contacting service providers mainly and then having them put me in touch with victims who are currently accessing their services. And then they then uh, would uh, provide live contacts with police, healthcare professionals, and others who are currently also servicing that victim uh, group. So in a way, you could say that all of the, although the matching hasn't been done to match the victim's responses with the specific social worker who was dealing with her case, um, you, you know from this sample that they are actually in an interacting or engaged sample in that they are receiving and providing services to each other. So in that sense, their views are, are very relevant in terms of comparing um, what one group thought in terms of receiving services versus what those who were providing the services thought and felt about how they were doing. Um, there were, unfortunately, no live contacts for um, the police in Hong Kong at the time that the study was being conducted. So unfortunately, among the women um, interviewed, they had uh, no longer um, they were no longer in touch with uh, their relevant police um, case handler, so they could not be uh, contacted for interviews and qu um, to question for the purposes of the study. Um, in terms of the methodology, it was a mixed method survey looking uh, using questionnaire uh, and uh, the interview to contextualize the responses derived from the questionnaires. Um, the tools were designed to examine the actual experiences of help seeking uh, and the barriers to access um, for the women, looking at their level of awareness of laws, their perception of discrimination, um, their fear of uh, the, the consequences of uh, filing for a complaint or seeking assistance in the different um, spheres, their knowledge and awareness of the legal system, and their perceptions about the handling of uh, domestic violence cases through the legal system, uh, and most importantly, their perceptions of service providers or frontline responders. Um, for the frontline responders, the questions were aimed at ascertaining their level of knowledge 
uh, of law, policy, uh, and the system and the process in relation to the myriad needs that domestic violence victims um, may have. For example, housing, um, access to social welfare, um, legal assistance, legal aid, um, access to children or uh, custody-related issues. Um, their attitudes towards ethnic minority and immigrant victims were also examined, as well as the recommendations in terms of interventions uh, that they thought were uh, most popularly used or agreeable to ethnic minority women, uh, and then the challenges that they themselves faced in the course of their work when working with this particular group. I've also uh, conducted an extensive literature review of existing work on ethnic minority victims, um, responses to domestic violence, um, and their help-seeking behavior, as has been um, studied internationally. So different um, minority groups have been looked at in the US, in Canada, in the UK, and I've looked at that literature. Uh, and also, um, we've got a couple of studies in Hong Kong only, but I've also incorporated the findings um, from those surveys into my literature review. The literature essentially shows and confirms that the effectiveness of available protections and provisions against domestic violence depends almost entirely on individual capacities of the victims themselves, and also on the institutional competence of legal and social structures and the frontline responders man, uh, manning those um, systems. These institutions and personnel perpetuate systemic discrimination and, in fact, replicate power structures in society. These power dynamics and discrimination um, impact the viability and effectiveness of interventions that are designed to help victims of domestic violence. On the other hand, internal factors such as cultural and religious value frameworks and external factors such as financial dependence, uh, language incompetence, immigration status, all of these impact victims' help-seeking behaviors and the likelihood that they would exercise certain options. In many cases, these factors undermine, combine to undermine the effectiveness of existing frameworks to provide timely intervention for redress. In Hong Kong, the studies have so far looked mostly at the Chinese um, culture and the impact of the Chinese cultural values um, on help seeking among mainland Chinese women. Factors such as immigration, language, and rurality have not been studied in great depth. The studies have also focused largely on personal barriers, uh, but haven't looked at their engagement with the system itself and the institutions. Um, so service provision and the cultural and legal competence of institutions and service providers has not been examined. Uh, insofar as ethnic minority and uh, immigrant women are concerned, there have only been two studies conducted in Hong Kong um, which have also focused on personal barriers and cultural value systems. Um, so this, set, this project uh, tried to address this research gap in Hong Kong uh, by looking at both the interventions of the service providers, the systemic framework, and also the attitudes of the women who are seeking services under them, uh, with the hope that when you put this together, we may develop a better understanding of any systemic level failures and the reasons for the inaccessibility so that we can inform our approaches to designing appropriate interventions for um, this group of women. The findings have um, important implications for a range of areas of reform, but today I'll be focusing uh, on sharing implications in relation to service provision and the need for empowering ethnic minority and immigrant women by designing culturally appropriate um, interventions. So as currently understood, uh, the protective framework is underscored by assumptions about victims and their experiences of violence, as well as what we anticipate to be the logical responses to such violence. And unfortunately, our assumptions do not account for the gendered nature of violence or the impact in, of the intimate setting on the relevance of the legal process, for example. So a woman's decision to stay with the abuser is sometimes uh, regarded as illogical. Um, uh, by many, particularly the police. Um, and we know from uh, work that has been done um, internationally that there is something that is called learned helplessness, uh, which is a condition where a victim no longer believes herself to be capable of escaping from the situation of violence. And so um, she decides to stay on. There are other reasons why some women stay on. For example, uh, they think that they would be at a 
less grave risk of future violence if they stay as opposed to if they fled. So there are several reasons uh, why women may stay in an abusive relationship, but these are seldom incorporated into the way in which um, interventions are designed or the structures uh, that exist for women to turn to when um, they come to seek help. And unfortunately, their efforts which take a great deal of courage, uh, are undermined by frontline respondents who either think she may be um, lying, that if it's so serious, then she would leave, or if there has been repeat violence over a long period of time, then she wouldn't be staying with the abuser, uh, and other such assumptions that underlie um, their responses uh, when they seek out help. So victims, um, for example, will not even always characterize themselves as victims of violent behavior. All right. They fail to see that they're subject to a pattern of abuse that is uh, consistent and constant. Um, she may not recognize that that behavior is unlawful. Um, she may not necessarily take steps to initiate a complaint. Right. So she may not be the first person to call out for help. Somebody may need to do that for her. Um, she may decide she does not want to seek police assistance. Or she may be unaware of existing social services uh, or that healthcare professionals and others can help her through this difficult time. Um, she may also be worried about the repercussions of taking such action. So there are these expectations uh, under the existing law, and then of course there are the considerations that victims actually take into account. Victims of domestic violence deploy a unique framework to process their responses to violent episodes, particularly when they are recurrent. They start to strategize, to think, and map out their resources, and try to calculate the risk and the pitfalls of acting out, certain, um, uh, acting out in certain ways. So the process um, has been extensively studied, and recent literature provides a compelling ar argument for us all to take such processes into account and in order to guarantee the relevance of the measures that we design to protect um, victims of uh, domestic violence. With that background then, in terms of the participants, um, the study looked or worked with 100 participants uh, from a range of the six target groups I identified. Um, the numbers are not representative, as they wouldn't be because we're trying to target so many different groups. Um, but what does emerge is a rich narrative data, both through the questionnaires and particularly through the interviews, which can be used to identify some of the emerging systemic level issues. Further, uh, and a more comprehensive study is, of course, required, um, one which is quantitative and qualitative. Um, and I'm hoping to apply for a grant to look at this further uh, in the coming months. The structure, then, of the research findings and how they're presented are a look at, first, the barriers that victims have highlighted as having experienced, and then the barriers that, according to the frontline um, responders, um, who, uh, who perceive ethnic minority victims as being reluctant to take certain steps. And then I'll be looking at the help-seeking behavior of victims uh, themselves, and then the help-seeking behavior as um, perceived or identified by the frontline responders. And finally, I'll be examining the victim's level of satisfaction and confidence in service provision um, as against the capacity of um, frontline responders to respond to their needs. Uh, and this incorporates also a self-rating by service providers to see how they think they're doing. So first of all, you can see that in terms of awareness of legal rights, um, and in terms of legal rights I looked at their awareness of anti-discrimination law, um, so their right to equal protection, and also uh, their awareness of domestic violence being unlawful. Um, and their knowledge regarding the other uh, forms of uh, provisions against domestic violence under the civil law rubric as well. In Hong Kong, you can see that the level of awareness uh, of laws is extremely low. Um, although the UK um, victims didn't necessarily exhibit a very high level of knowledge either. Most of the victims seemed to know that domestic violence was wrong or problematic, but they were crippled by other barriers or fears um, if they spoke out. Um, the issue uh, is multi-layered, and it's not just about awareness of rights. And so, as I said, uh, immigration status also com complicates the picture, and I'll talk a little bit more about this um, in a while. Um, you can see from the quotation, for example, that even when women have acted in self-defense, um, uh, a woman in the UK, for example, said she didn't want to call the police because she didn't know she had the right to defend herself and was worried 
that she would be guilty of violence in the circumstances given that she had just retaliated. Um, similarly, in Hong Kong, a victim complained uh, that she was worried that self-defense attempts could lead to an arrest by the police because you know, they would both have competing stories of he did this and I did that. One ethnic minority woman um, lamented that when the police came, they didn't even speak to her. Uh, so they turned up at the front door, rang the bell, and the father-in-law opened the door. Uh, and because the father-in-law could speak Cantonese, the policeman just talked to him and asked, well, what happened? And so the father-in-law had this long conversation with the police, uh, and at no point did the police seek to verify the version uh, of events that had been given to the police uh, by the father-in-law, even though the victim was the one who called. Um, and she was simply told to pack her belongings and she would be taken to a safe place. Um, she packed her things, and she had a small, she had a young baby of about, um, at the time, eight months old, and she proceeded to carry the baby. And the policeman said, don't, uh, don't take your baby with you. We don't have uh, space for the baby today. We'll come back tomorrow and collect your baby as well. Um, she went along with the policeman, not knowing what had been discussed. Um, and as you'll learn from her example later, uh, it's been two years and she's never seen her baby since because the parents, well, the in-laws and the husband have denied her uh, access to the baby. Fear is also uh, something that uh, dominates their um, minds uh, when they think about rights. Even though they know they have them, they don't feel they're able to exercise them. In terms of perceptions uh, about the law and authority, um, you can see that, so the V represents victims and the C represents community members from ethnic minority and immigrant backgrounds, but not necessary, and not victims, okay? So in the United Kingdom, you can see that the victim group generally has a higher rating across the board on all fronts, right? So you've got providing justice speedily, helping victims obtain meaningful outcomes, um, protecting the innocent, right? So the victims rated, um, highly across the board in terms of their level of satisfaction with performance, but not, the, not their level of confidence, okay? And accessibility of the system seems to be the biggest obstacle in the UK, both for victims and non-victim women. And you can contrast these consistently lower ratings um, by the UK community women in most aspects. Um, so you can see that actually those who've never been victimized have a poorer perception of law and authority uh, compared with victims who have uh, had encounters with the legal system or the law enforcement authorities. Um, and that's dangerous as well because it means that if they perceive they're not going to be treated well or if they perceive they're not going to be satisfied with the law enforcement process, then it may impact their likelihood of seeking help if they are victimized. So there's some work that needs to be done there. In Hong Kong, the picture looks completely different. Um, community women seem to be more optimistic about the justice system. Notably, their biggest expectations were to protect, so that the, the law and authority were able to protect the innocent people, and they were well able to determine the guilt of the abuser. Whereas these were the very things that victims uh, in Hong Kong complained had not been uh, achieved or met, or in their perception, uh, you know, weren't being done well. So these were the ones that attracted low ratings. You can also see something similar with um, the providing justice quickly category. Victims did not feel that law and authority were able to help uh, achieve justice quickly. Also, the low score of providing justice quickly uh, in Hong Kong, the victim, um, one of the victims said that it took her 10 years to finalize her divorce. Uh, there was a similar complaint from a victim in the UK um, who found the legal process to be too long-winded. Um, and more recently, one of the victims in the Hong Kong um, sample uh, has just concluded um, proceedings in the Hong Kong courts, and she found that the judge seemed to be biased against her because the judge said that violence is only physical violence. Um, so she didn't consider the other forms of violence to be violence. Um, she did not consider the impact of domestic violence to be significant for children because apparently children would have short-term memories and would soon forget. Um, she also made, the judge also made comments about how um, if the victim had experienced such serious violence over a, a number of years, she would have left the marriage by now. And so her conclusion was that she didn't believe that the victim had been um, this, the, the victim of violence um, 
to such an extent. So she believed, although there was discord in the family, there was disharmony, uh, that to some extent the victim was found to be exaggerating her evidence. Um, so there's clearly a, a, uh, a perception issue there. Um, victims may be more optimistic in Hong Kong, um, particularly in terms of the mainland Chinese community women, but the, st the score is still not particularly high. So here the point is that mainland women may rate Hong Kong system better, at least comparative to the form of justice they may expect on the mainland. Um, so they may have a romanticized impression of the rule of law uh, compared to what they see at home. But for ethnic minority women, um, the considerations may be different uh, and um, they may perceive um, systemic barriers and so not necessarily rate the system uh, as highly. In the UK, again, uh, if you look at satisfaction with uh, police performance, you can see that the victim group generally has a higher rating across the board. Uh, note the big contrast in the category of treating everyone fairly. Community women in the UK had the perception that they would not be treated fairly by the police. Again, a sign that they may be less likely to contact the police if abused. Um, but victims who did interact with the police were very satisfied. Um, you can see that, in fact, they scored a full score of five out of five uh, on that um, front by the victims, um, and they did not feel discriminated again. In Hong Kong, the picture is also similar, but the differences seem to be smaller. So again, those who... Um, contacted the police, rated them three out of five um, as treating everyone fairly, okay? Compared with the community victim who had less confidence that the police were capable of doing so. Um, but again, as I said, I don't think these scores are particularly high, um, especially given that they're about perceptions. And so that may spell out some of the kind of work that needs to be done. Um, these are scores that were derived from responses to the questionnaire, uh, and I think that they should be supplemented rightly by the more um, in-depth uh, answers that we got to questionnaire, um, questions that came up in the interview, because they provide uh, more concrete examples of how women were f uh, feeling when they dealt with law enforcement and authority. Um, so in Hong Kong, uh, you can see that victims' comments about police seem to be pretty uh, negative. Police seem to dismiss cases more readily as domestic incidents. In the case I mentioned about the woman who went to court, um, in fact, uh, she, when she accessed police records to produce her statements in court, uh, she found that the police had not recorded her statement accurately and had missed out a lot of the detail. Uh, and when I asked her, had the police given her her statement to review, uh, she said the police had never let her review her own statement in order to supplement or add anything, which, as, as we know, is, is standard practice and ought to be done um, so that we can ensure accuracy and that the statement is duly that of the witness concerned. Um, there was also, um, there were consistent complaints that there were no female officers available. So although we know that we have police officers who are female, for some reason, they're not as readily available at the time that the victims ring. Uh, and when they ask on the phone, can you have a female officer accompany you? Um, the response they got is, you know, there's no female uh, officer on duty currently, or, um, you know, they're off today or something uh, to that effect. Um, some women complained that they didn't feel safe with the police. Um, they feared not being treated fairly. Um, and there were also cases of victims being arrested for assaulting um, the abuser. So uh, there were fears on that front. Um, in the UK, the response was quite different. Um, most of them felt that they were treated fairly and felt protected and supported, and that the police took domestic violence seriously. Although there was one, of, uh, one victim who complained that the police seemed to side with her husband and fail to protect her. Uh, in some boroughs in the UK, um, they have now got specialized domestic violence units, and those teams, uh, and they have a specialized DV advocate as well, who is an independent advocate. Uh, they found that those um, boroughs seem to be faring much better in terms of victims' um, evaluation of their performance. Uh, there were also community safety units in the UK to uh, ensure that the quality of work being done in relation to domestic violence was of a high quality. Um, so this is consistent with the um, table um, in terms of the UK responses, but inconsistent with what we see um, in terms of the victims' responses about Hong Kong policemen. Uh, and the experiences seem to suggest that 
they had far more negative things to say compared to the scores that they gave. Um, there, can, there may be various explanations uh, for this, particularly the way in which the question was designed or the desire not to rate too poorly or simply having a scale uh, where you want to give some marks as opposed to zero. Uh, so there are various reasons why this might have happened. Um, in terms of police interventions, um, we compared how victims felt about the UK no-drop prosecution policy. So there's a compulsory or mandatory prosecution policy against all uh, abusers uh, in the UK. Um, and uh, there are various pros and cons that came up in the course of um, the interview. For example, the downside of the positive action policy in the UK, uh, women said, was that when the perpetrator returned home, the assault was uh, much worse and more regularly repeated. So they feared repeat and more serious um, types of violence after the abuser got out because he was angry uh, that he was uh, forced to go to prison or to be punished uh, as a result of the woman complaining about him. Um, the upside is that domestic violence appeared to be taken seriously and the message was clear that it had to be deterred and it will be dealt with. Uh, so again, this accords with the women's attitudes and perceptions of law and authority that they felt that, you know, the police in the UK seemed to be taking it seriously and were not dismissive of their complaints. Um, there have been, however, uh, severe issues concerning ethnic minority women um, in the UK who end up as victims um, whereby their prosecutions tend to be victimless prosecutions because there's a lot of family pressure to withdraw their complaint. Um, and because of the no-drop policy in the UK, the um, police will still pursue the prosecution. Uh, in Hong Kong, women seem to uh, say that it would be good if there was a way to... Um, to pursue the prosecution, but they were also aware that this would come with certain consequences that would be undesirable for them. In terms of immigration, as I've said earlier, this poses a significant and unique barrier to ethnic minority women um, if you try to consider it in light of what they've said about police perception and their perception of law and authority, and what you'll also see them saying about discrimination. Um, in terms of access to services, uh, in the UK there is a rule against recourse to public funds if you're an immigrant. Okay, So um, the rule has caused a great deal of difficulty for immigrant women who find themselves in the state of um, limbo and often a state of destitution. Uh, and one of the social workers in the United Kingdom said that with this rule, it's in fact better for single women without children to go to prison because they're more likely to be looked after there considering that they can't access social welfare in the UK as an immigrant. Um, and also because of the NPRF uh, rule, they're uh, left entirely uh, unsafe because they can't utilize um, shelters uh, that are government funded um, and things like that. So the quotation you can see is, is particularly powerful because uh, well, the, the one about saying, well, she's better off in prison, because it highlights the destitution that the women have to face as a result of this very solid uh, and strict rule against accessing public services. Um, in terms of legal aid, uh, both Hong Kong and the UK um, do not have a bar on legal aid, regardless of immigration status. Um, however, uh, it was surprising that most of the frontline service providers, particularly um, the NGOs, were not aware of the availability and the eligibility of women uh, for legal aid um, in both jurisdictions. And this became a particular uh, issue, especially if they were contesting uh, custody uh, proceedings or seeking to stay on under their own independent uh, visa uh, if their visa sponsorship application was tied to the abuser himself. Um, In Hong Kong, um, the recourse or access to public services, the reason I've said it's discretionary is because even though in, uh, there are still rules that are being developed uh, in relation to the degree of access, for the most part, access depends on who you get as your social worker who's working on your case. And so the social worker always has the discretion to write um, uh, an application in your favor in order to help you access whether it's compassionate housing uh, or other services. Uh, and, and that decision lies with them. And so in a sense, if they are not um, fully aware of your situation or don't understand it, that can prove to be a serious barrier in terms of what you can get out of the system, even though provisions are available. Um, the 
The other consideration that is important in the context of immigration is the rule uh, regarding the visa status of the women. So as I said earlier, the sponsorship situation becomes complicated where the husband is the sponsor of the woman uh, in the country. Um, and in the UK, they had a rule, uh, they have a rule that if you have uh, or can show evidence that you're a victim of domestic violence, then you'll be allowed to stay on and have your visa status considered independently um, of the spouse. So even though they withdraw their sponsorship, you can still be considered. And this, of course, is particularly beneficial for women with um, family, uh, especially children. However, the rule has been uh, criticized because it's only limited to spousal visas, not other forms of um, visas. Uh, and the women must sign a waiver not to um, appeal the decision that is made uh, in relation to their visa status. Uh, the application for such uh, a concession can only be made online, and women may not be able to navigate um, the uh, application system if they're not tech savvy. And there are also uh, difficulties if they've not accessed um, service providers because there's no proof. So you have to have um, uh, something record uh, and oftentimes such a record is difficult to obtain apparently uh, if the physical if the abuse is not physical in nature so uh, in hong kong in contrast um, there is a discretion as to whether you're allowed a prolonged stay um, depending on whether you're involved in a legal proceeding or not um, so there are some duties on the part of immigration uh, officers uh, to advise women in such circumstances that there may be things that they can do. And there are some interesting recommendations that came out of the interviews with the UK agencies who said, for example, that immigration officers um, had developed videos um, that were played on, uh, on the flights when women were coming uh, to to uh, alert them to the possibility uh, of availing of this rule. Um, and uh, there were also uh, there was information provided about what visa holders were in, entitled to uh, in terms of support services. There was also a fear, however, uh, regardless of the status of this rule, that the moment you try to seek assistance um, because you are an abused woman, that puts your children at immediate risk of abuse of future violence. And so children might be taken away from you. And social workers in the UK acknowledged that there is this tension uh, if a woman tried to seek assistance um, and there was no recourse to public funds for her because she was an immigrant woman, then the mother would be discouraged from seeking help because she knew that this could lead to the children being taken away from her. Um, on the other hand, of course, she would value services um, to help her deal with the violence, but oftentimes would decide not to take um, that step. We also found that um, substance abuse was a problem among some of the uh, women who were victims of domestic violence. So substance abuse of the abuser. Okay, so the perpetrator of violence uh, was likely to be using um, alcohol or drugs, uh, and that sometimes impacted the uh, nature of the violence and its regularity as well. And so um, the better substance and alcohol abuse has been identified as a prevalent risk um, factor by social workers across multiple jurisdictions. Uh, and in Hong Kong, some service providers said that women, uh, the, the way in which they found out that the women were victims of domestic violence was because they complained about their husband's drinking problems or drug problems. Um, in the UK, there are specialized um, drug and alcohol social workers to handle domestic violence cases uh, in the context of a multidisciplinary case conference um, so that um, substance abusers can be flagged for a special referral program for rehabilitation um, because the general refuge or shelter would not be adequate to deal with um, the uh, rehabilitation efforts. Um, but they also lacked the cultural dimension in, in their services. So for example, if you think of counseling and um, behavioral, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, if you have an interpreter, uh, you know, a third party in the room, it purges the atmosphere of trust and building that relationship with your counselor in order to benefit entirely from the therapy. And that there weren't adequate services available in the language of the ethnic minorities meant that they had no choice but to rely on this third party. And as I'll come to share with you in a moment, the intervention of interpreters is also problematic because oftentimes the interpreters are known to members of the ethnic minority community. It's a very small network of people and uh, there is, again, stigma, shame, and judgment passing there. And so oftentimes uh, victims do not want to be a part of such um, interventions. Um, 
In the UK and in Australia as well, uh, I found that there are um, alcohol and drug-related domestic violence specialized uh, services and caseworkers and refuges. So you can start to see that a um, that one best practice model is to provide a holistic approach to dealing with the different issues that a woman may be facing. And it's not as simple as just the violence. It's often Yes, you're a victim of violence, but what do you do about the children? What about your immigration status? How are you going to survive? Are you able to work? Um, and then, you know, if, you're per if the perpetrator um, is your spouse and is an abuser uh, of substance as well, how do you deal with that? So you're trying to remedy and deal with all of those things because they all need a sh addressing at the same time, the moment that you raise uh, violence as an issue. But these are not things that are on the checklist for most service providers. They have a very singular focus of, okay, you know, these are the things you can do. You can file for an injunction. You can go to court. Um, so in a way, the reality of the situation and its complexity seems to be lost on service providers, and that's unfortunate. So the barriers faced by ethnic minority and immigrant victims is multi-layered. Whether their behavior will be endorsed or condemned by their own community, that's a very significant um, concern for them. And oftentimes, unfortunately, the perception also is that when you seek social welfare services or you go to uh, NGOs, that's something that white people do, right? So one of the victims in the UK said that this is a white people business. It's an anathema. It's not something that I'm used to. Or they were resistant to counseling because counseling was seen as mental people, right? And, and, and so there's that cultural um, uh, aversion to particular types of intervention uh, and that's not to say that you can't therefore um, advise them that they may need counseling or it would help them, but it's about trying to help them understand the ways in which co such counseling can be beneficial and it's not necessarily uh, for people who have an illness of the mind. Um, Oftentimes, interpretation services that are offered are also um, not entirely uh, sensitized to the cultural uh, context. For example, um, you provide a pure interpretation model without accounting for the other concerns, and that may be unmeaningful. So culturally insensitive or unviable advice may drive victims away. Um, this is especially so um, given that external help is a matter of last resort. So oftentimes, the victims that I was interviewing, they were coming having experienced violence after a number of years. So they're, they're the most serious um, cases that are the most serious. And so violence um, perpetrated towards victims uh, on a less regular basis or that is less serious or less long term, those victims have probably not been flagged uh, and are not seeking help because external help is a matter of last resort due to a number of reasons, but particularly, um, for example, one ethnic minority victim said she stopped seeing her social worker because her social worker insisted that if, you're, if you want to get out of the situation of violence, you have no choice but to divorce your husband. And if you don't file for divorce, I'm afraid I don't think you're serious about leaving him. You don't want to help yourself, so I can't help you. Okay? So the woman was driven away because divorce didn't sit well with her as a relevant solution to the problem. There was also a feeling among women that um, the organizations didn't understand their concerns and situation. And so they were offering, they were trying to offer help but the help uh, didn't um, address their circumstantial um, needs. Many social workers also complained that they found ethnic minorities less likely to show up for follow-up meetings, and they were frustrated. So you spend a lot of time doing a case history and trying to understand the woman's problem, and then she doesn't show up for the next two or three appointments, and then six months down the line, she's back because there's been a serious episode of violence. And the problem is that... Um, the perception among social workers and service providers is that um, this is a waste of our investment and resources, so it's better if they go somewhere else because clearly they're not happy with us. But one, one difficulty was, you know, the social worker is not asking the, the question as to, well, why are these women preferring to suffer in silence? Or why have they disappeared? You know, is something wrong? Uh, should I call them and try to find out? Um, so there was no um, effort to understand perhaps there was a mismatch or a misunderstanding or a, an, a different kind of um, unsuitability there and whether they could do something to help them rather than leave them uh, in their own plight. So um, this 
attitude also um, led to statements or words being used which suggested, again, a very negative perception among social workers and service providers uh, toward ethnic minority and immigrant women. They often called them ungrateful uh, and such behavior as being irresponsible, and therefore they were undeserving of, uh, of assistance. So these attitudes obviously have no place in the service realm and would create difficulties, especially if women as a group or particular women as a group are perceived to be undeserving of help despite their situation. So you can start to see that I've um, mapped out a series uh, of barriers that are perceived by women um, victims of domestic violence in these contexts. And particularly, of course, there's the cultural dimension, which I mentioned at the outset, uh, relating to feelings of shame or the entitlement of the husband um, to beat you. Uh, so the cultural um, expectation that you will tolerate because that's what a good wife does. Also the cultural burden that you will not complain to people outside your family because that is unbecoming of a good wife. Uh, and of course, uh, all of the um, social stigma that attaches to being you know, part of a family that is violent. Um, and then you know, if, if your husband ends up in trouble with the law, well, you're the one who sent your husband to jail and you're the only one to br blame for the destitution of your family or the breakup of your family. Uh, and, and so there's a great deal of um, burdens that lie on the shoulder of women who are grappling with violence. Um, so you can see that there's the concerns with um, law enforcement and authority, their uncertainty about their immigration status, their uncertainty about their rights uh, and what their entitlements are, and then the attitudes and perceptions of other people uh, around them, including social workers, service providers, healthcare professionals, policemen, but also they feel answerable to their own community, which will be a very tight network usually um, when they're living uh, in a foreign um, country away from home. Um, the quotation, um, again, you know, it's very telling. Uh, oftentimes they speak in terms that are really dramatic because that's what it means for them. So it's like a disgrace for my family. I will be thrown out. Uh, nobody will speak to me. I'll be ostracized forever. Okay. In terms of frontline responders, then, their views were uh, that the obstacles that women faced um, in terms of accessing services was a lack of confidence in or fear of law enforcement agencies. Um, but you can also see from the rating that they've clearly underestimated um, this particular barrier. Uh, in UK, language is highlighted as compared to Hong Kong and Australia um, because language doesn't seem to pose as much of a problem in the UK. And it was consistently reported in interviews and the questionnaires uh, of the agencies um, and service users that language is still a problem, uh, even though they have a strong network of interpreters available on call 24-7, uh, and it's quite a fluid system, uh, but they still um, they still flagged it as something that as something that could still be further improved. Um, on their own, you can see that each of these factors, um, as standalone factors, are are significant barriers. But if you consider them together, in that any one victim woman could be facing a number of these as barriers, then the compound effect uh, and the severity and risk to the woman then uh, is particularly phenomenal and significant. If all of these barriers to help seeking um, are prevalent in a given number of cases, uh, it, could re it could mean that there's no realistic prospects for seeking help or having effective help. Um, in the manner that you need it. So the barriers are rated as consistently high across the board, as you can see, and so again reveals that there's much work that needs to be done in terms of empowering women and building their capacities to use the system. Many of the victims uh, shared that their experiences, um, when they experienced violence, they would be more likely to talk to friends and family because they were from a similar background, and thus they could understand their needs and concerns more effectively. Um, the experience was not always positive, however, so friends would sometimes rebuke them or persuade them to stay with the abuser um, and maintain their uh, relationship. Um, ethnic minority and immigrant women 
victims seem to be more willing to um, take uh, steps to seek help and escape violence uh, in the UK seems to suggest that there's something that they're doing there that may be right. Okay, so you have this, a similar group of women who are disadvantaged in similar ways in terms of cultural ling language uh, accessibility issues, but yet they're more likely to reach out to the services in the UK. And one of the uh, highlights in terms of um, the findings was that the possibility of um, going to a shelter which was specialist in that it targeted a particular um, group of ethnic minority women, so women who were Muslim, for example, or the Jewish women shelter, or the Kurdish women shelter. There were very, very specific shelters set up to address the needs of that particular group. And those women found that they were able to provide culturally sensitive assistance, which they found to be comforting and relevant and worth pursuing. So they found a community of women who had similar experiences like them, who understood their limitations as well, culturally, uh, linguistically, and in terms of their immigration experience in the UK. So they identified more closely with these women. Um, they did, however, sometimes say that there was the drawback that you know these women might know you, they might know your family back home. Uh, it was still shameful to them uh, to be open about their um, uh, family situation, but they still felt this was better and more uh, culturally appropriate and relevant compared to going to a general service provider in the UK uh, who would um, not be able to share their concerns in, in a similar fashion. Uh, in terms of um, the frontline agencies, uh, their view was that the women were more likely to pursue um, these options, uh, and they rated them accordingly. So you can see that the um, option of separation and staying at a shelter um, seemed to be uh, popular, but as we know from the interviews uh, of, with the women, um, many of them would, would refuse uh, those options because they're not culturally relevant to them. Um, we can also see uh, that there's an undesirably high risk of um, those uh, women who are less likely to take action and would more likely return to the abuser. So those are the numbers which uh, show that there's the hi that are highest rated, which means that women, even though they have a range of options, are more likely to exercise um, the option not to take any action or to go back to the abuser, and that is of uh, concern. So those are just the numbers in terms of likelihood of seeking legal protection, police assistance, and um, filing for separation or divorce. Um, as I said, these are the perceptions of um, service providers as to the options that are pursued, um, but they're not likely to be entirely accurate because, well, if you go by the uh, self-reporting of the women concerned. Um, also interesting is you can see that religious mediation is not a particularly popular option. Um, so uh, only one... Uh, of the women in each of the groups uh, suggested that this is what they would um, do. Medical attention is also another uh, category that seems to be uh, worrying and problematic because women seem to be less likely to yeah, seek medical attention. In Hong Kong, none of the ethnic minority women uh, who I interviewed went to the hospital for their injuries. Um, ethnic minority and immigrant women in the UK seem to be uh, more likely to seek different types of assistance compared to uh, similarly situated women in Hong Kong. And this could be explained by a greater level of awareness um, in terms of service availability and the UK agency's exclusive focus on particular uh, women from particular backgrounds and providing um, culturally and religiously uh, appropriate services and options. In general, uh, victims reported feeling more at ease relating their experiences to friends and family um, uh, although there was this awkwardness. Uh, in terms of um, fears of consequences uh, in relation to help seeking, the women expressed grave concern about their own conceptions about what it means to be a loyal uh, and good wife and, and that you know, a failed marriage was a measurement of their success in life. So they self-defined completely based on how their marriage looked and this is what posed the biggest barrier to them uh, in terms of uh, going out to get help because it would mean acknowledging and admitting that they had failed. Uh, and so it may be worth thinking about what are the other factors in their life that signal success, right? Have they got uh, education or prospects for uh, becoming an entrepreneur or working? Uh, and, and so could these be other ways of helping them define their successes um, in life? Many victims also expressed that they believe they would face deportation, 
separation from their children uh, for good. Um, and they were also financially dependent on their spouses because none of the women interviewed had full-time employment, and only one of the women interviewed worked part-time. So you can see, again, they're mostly uh, entirely dependent on their spouses. And that meant if they complained to the police and the husband lost his job or went to prison or faced any other uh, difficulties at work, then she would be the reason for her family's povertization. So th the fact that the husband's often the sole breadwinner also results, to compli uh, results in complications and the choices that the women make. And then, of course, I've already alluded to the unsuitability of divorce and separation because they are instigators of social isolation in the community and seriously impact um, family ties and friendships. And also, in some cases, women thought that they impact women's future, um, children's future prospects of marriageability because if they came from broken homes, then uh, they would have a tough time settling down in their community. Uh, there is also stigma uh, associated with um, these the failure or the lack of resilience of these women because they turn to outside help. Um, so this makes uh, this group of women particularly less likely to reach out um, for help. So then how are the institutions doing uh, in terms of providing uh, competent and relevant uh, interventions? So some service providers in the UK I looked at um, provided specialist uh, services, as I said. Um, and then we also interviewed a number of generalist service providers. Um, there were also groups that acknowledged that recently there had been a widening or a larger uh, number of ethnic minority and immigrant women seeking out help at their agencies. But despite this, only three, um, only five uh, service providers in the UK and only two in Hong Kong said they expanded their services um, to cater to this surge in women seeking help from them in relation to domestic violence. Uh, in terms of legal capacity, well, capacity uh, of uh, law and relevant provisions, um, Hong Kong um, service providers seem to be uh, less aware compared to their UK counterparts across most fronts, um, except in relation to their knowledge of DV-specific laws. Um, but even there, I mean, this grouping uh, includes um, the knowledge of healthcare professionals, police, and service providers. And I just want to take a moment to single out service providers, um, because you can see that their level of knowledge is significantly low, particularly insofar as anti-discrimination law is concerned, and even domestic violence-related legislation. Um, the law relating to uh, criminal offenses, such as offenses against the person and assault, are are uh, dangerously low. Only 12.5% um, had knowledge of those laws. So there's clearly um, a need to uh, raise awareness and um, equip them with a, a, a more skilled uh, workforce so that they're able to um, effectively advise women because a lack of knowledge has critical implications for uh, frontline staff's ability to effectively assess and advise women of their options. Um, and that's very poor, especially if you're considering taking a rights-based approach um, to determining their options. So how do you assess options and their effectiveness um, if you don't know the full range of options. So devising appropriate safety plans and guiding and counseling women through this difficult process at a sensitive time is key, but you can't do that with half-baked knowledge. Okay. In terms of networking, um, the community uh, of pro professionals involved with servicing domestic violence victims uh, seem to not work together as often as they should uh, on the whole. Although in the UK, they were more likely to have a network of collaboration for ethnic minority and immigration cases. In Australia also, it's a significant practice. So vast majority of the service provision respondents agreed that having a multi-agency response network had a direct bearing on the quality of their domestic violence services. So in the UK, there's actually a formalized program as there is in, the, um, in Australia where there will be multidisciplinary conferences among each of the professionals handling a particular case. They will sit in a room and talk about a particular victim's case as a whole. So what's happening on the legal front? What's happening in terms of healthcare and counseling? How are the children doing? What's happening with their education? 
Does the woman have financial uh, support? Does she need retraining skills? All of that is considered on a case-by-case -case basis. But this is not happening uh, in Hong Kong uh, as regularly as it should, and not all concerned parties are invited to these case conferencing um, activities. So um, that's another area to improve on in terms of best practice. In terms of the quality of services, we try to compare the service users identifying shortcomings on their own and then um, the identification of shortcomings um, by the victims. So in terms of Hong Kong victims' perceptions of the quality of services, um, half of them uh, said that they, they thought the agencies understood their needs and concerns and that they were treated in accordance with their needs. But again, the examples they gave, the stories they told, seems to belie that that's an accurate figure. Again, it's probably um, uh, skewed by the fact that these women were referred by the agencies themselves to interview with us. And so uh, they may be a little reluctant to be too honest about their ratings. Um, Hong Kong examples uh, in terms of shortfalls were particularly um, the failure to take into account dietary needs of the women concerned in the shelter. Um, so providing beef, pork, chicken, um, and, and no sort of uh, suitable options for them if they were vegetarian or didn't eat any of these meats. Um, custody of children. Uh, there was nobody who could advise them properly on what might happen. And at least um, a significant number of women, at least a quarter of them, lamented that they'd lost their children as a result of a, a poor, um, poor legal advice or poor advice from the agencies concerned. And then lastly, the, one of the significant fa factors, as I said earlier, was that the insistence on separation or divorce before, for example, a social worker would assist them uh, further. The agencies, sorry, going back to the victims, they also cited communication problems, discrimination, and insensitive um, questions and advice. Um, in terms of the agencies, they identified language barriers as a significant hurdle. Um, but this is odd because although the government has uh, funded uh, a service provider to provide interpretation services um, through uh, agencies like CHEER or Hong Kong Translingual Services provide, uh, provides interpretation, the numbers seem to suggest that there's less outreach from the uh, from these agencies themselves, and there's also limited outreach from the social welfare department. So although interpretation is available, the numbers suggest an underutilization of these services. Um, the shelters were also found to be unsurvivable for ethnic minority victims. So the shelters and the service providers recognize that the shelters are too homogenous, uh, and, and having ethnic minority women there uh, often results in uh, conflicts in relation to food, language. Um, they also face isolation and often end up uh, having conflicts with uh, other Chinese women living there. Again, you can compare this experience with the UK, where they've managed to resolve these disputes um, by having specialized shelters targeting particular groups of minority women um, who are uh, able to relate to the services more and feel more at home. Language barriers. Um, I want to pick up on what I was saying earlier about the um, use of interpretation and the unsuitability sometimes in, in the context of domestic violence victims. Almost all of the organizations participating um, indicated that they had staff or access to personnel who could respond to clients in a variety of languages other than English um, or Chinese. But they still said that language is a significant barrier to providing quality services. Um, the impression. I got, uh, at least from the UK agencies, was that language can be a barrier, but they overcome it pretty well. And the reason is because in the UK, you have ethnic minority social workers. You have ethnic minority healthcare professionals. So they can relate to, to some of the minority women in their native language without needing the intervention of an interpreter. The second um, added advantage uh, or pra best practice in the UK was that interpreters had to undergo a formal accreditation program. So they were trained in the ethics of interpretation and the professionalism required of them as interpreters. Um, and the benefits of such a professional uh, interpretation service, provi uh, service provision cannot be understated, particularly, sorry, cannot be overstated, particularly given the kinds of issues that have come up in the Hong Kong context. So for example, in Hong Kong, um, in one case, because the interpreter was from a small community um, in the village of the victim concerned, uh, she abandoned the interpretation process halfway at the doctors because she was, she was worried that the perpetrator would come after her, having learned that she participated in this process. So um, 
the doctor was then left uh, to communicate with the victim uh, on, on her own. In the UK, um, you know, there are readily trained uh, and on-call uh, interpreters available on site. Uh, whether you're talking about counseling, healthcare, uh, social services, courtroom, uh, it's systematized properly, whereas in Hong Kong, this was found to be lacking. Um, there was another case in which um, a victim said that the interpreter told her off, actually rebuked, rebuked her and scolded her, saying that, how dare you come here and complain to your husband? If you don't go home promptly, I'm going to tell him where you are. So there are clearly um, problems with the way in which we uh, accredit or appoint interpreters, and we fail to think effectively about how using one interpreter in one context may actually be harmful to the woman concerned. And we also need to broaden our talent pool. So for example, the fact that in Hong Kong, we only had our first social worker ever from an ethnic minority background qualified just last year uh, is, is shocking, that there's only one ethnic minority social worker in practice in Hong Kong registered. Um, so these are areas that need significant improvement. On discrimination, um, the social workers' uh, responses uh, tend to seem, and the service providers as well, uh, thought that ethnic minority women were not entitled to the same level of service as local um, people. And this was a perception um, that a significant number of Hong Kong social workers had, which is uh, worrying. Social workers are often regarded as the um, gatekeepers of the public purse. Um, and it's also reported in, in some of the uh, Hong Kong literature that social workers branded mainland wives, for example, as gold diggers, and they often blame victims for their own plight when their husbands, who are much older than them uh, oftentimes, uh, that they put themselves in this position and so they should deal with it themselves. So there is some level of um, uh, judgmentalism uh, uh, which, which feeds this belief that the women uh, deserve what they're getting. And unfortunately, this kind of an attitude has also creeped into the perceptions towards ethnic minorities because social workers lack an understanding of their cultural context and blame the women for believing in or having values that are old-fashioned or the values are the reason why they face these problems and if they would agree to divorce, then they could get rid of it, so why don't they do it? Um, similarly, for women who are religious, particularly um, Muslim women, the perception is, well, if you're going to belong to such a conservative religion, then you have no options whatsoever. No matter what I suggest, you're going to be stuck in this, so I can't really help you. Um, one of the statements uh, quoted there uh, is um, what an ethnic minority woman in the UK related to me about what a social worker said. She said, why are you in such a relationship? Why do you have to stay in the UK if you know you don't have status? You should have gone back. So um, women aren't feeling like they belong, and they experience a great deal of social isolation and exclusion and dislocation. Um, and they're often told to go back to their home countries. And they're very aware of this, and, and oftentimes they don't want to face this, and so they, they don't want to seek help. In terms of discrimination, um, the number of women who sell, said that they felt that women of their background were discriminated against on uh, ethnic, religious, or racial grounds, um, again, is very few. So it's a question of whether women recognize discrimination when they see it, or whether they think that um, it's so normal that they've internalized it uh, and aren't able to pick up on it. Um, but again, the experiences and what they're telling us seem to suggest that discrimination is also quite rife. Cultural competence. Um, although frontline responders are aware that ethnic minorities have different needs in terms of domestic violence services, not all frontline workers, especially those in Hong Kong, consider themselves to be culturally competent. Um, and adequately equipped to handle all of the needs um, that these women seem to have. So you can see that their self-rating is fairly poor compared to the UK, and all of these scores are out of five. So again, I mean, it's either average or just slightly above average. Um, in terms of the UK, the healthcare professionals and police rated themselves the highest out of all frontline um, service providers, uh, scoring 4.2 and 4 out of 5, respectively, whereas service providers and social workers rated them slightly lower at 3.9 and 3.5, respectively. So again, they also recognize or feel that there's still much work to be done. Um, in Hong Kong, um, the self-rated scores are considerably lower at 2.8 and, and 2.5 in terms of cultural competence. Um, and of course, this feeds 
um, women's expectations uh, of what they think they can get from these uh, service providers, including their level of trust, um, the quality of services, uh, and their bad experiences will affect future help-seeking behavior and may explain, actually, the high level of attrition that is complained of by the service sector among this particular group of victims. So um, agencies... Um, in terms of their level of cultural competence uh, that can be explained by the training um, and the institutionalization of the training. So only half the agencies surveyed received ongoing training. Uh, they complained of a lack of opportunity, funding, or a lack of a proper trainer and lack of time. Uh, and some of them complained that they had a lack of incentive. So social workers said, for example, that it didn't matter even if you had cultural sensitivity training because they don't accept those values. Uh, they reject those values as appropriate values to live by. Uh, and so they felt that they were at a dead end and that these exercises of forced training were just uh, an exercise in ticking the box. Uh, so there's something that needs to be done in terms of incentivizing um, staff to recognize the importance of um, you know, the ingrained prejudice uh, and how it doesn't sit well with providing um, culturally appropriate services. Um, there are also, of course, then best practice models uh, that we've seen in the UK and Australia where third-tier organizations provide sensitivity training. So it's not done in-house. It's done by an independent agency. Um, UK and Australia policy research training capacity and capacity building uh, and service development are the focus of such third-tier organizations. And this is something that's grossly lacking in Hong Kong. In fact, um, for the agencies that said that they had trained, uh, I'd asked them to share their materials. And I found that some of the material itself was culturally insensitive and inappropriate, uh, and also harbored certain stereotypes that were problematic. So there is a need for an institutionalization of cultural competence through um, their, you know, through education at the degree level, and then for mandatory training pre-service, and then in-service regular uh, training as well. Uh, sometimes service providers uh, drew on the personal networks of ethnic minority women to fill in gaps relating to interpretation um, and other sort of uh, explanations they wanted to uh, convey to the woman to persuade her to take certain actions. So they would ask the women to bring their uh, family members or their children to help interpret. Uh, and again, you know, this is highly problematic uh, because it could impact the safety of the women and also uh, it, it results in backlash from the community. There may be unprofessional interpretation advice. It would also facilitate the spread of gossip, which is something that um, the women complained they were worried about. And of course, there's a risk of escalated violence if the matter gets back um, to the perpetrator concerned. So many victims do not think that this is appropriate, um, uh, and, and their wishes should be respected. There were ways, however, in which communities could be effectively leveraged. So in the UK, for example, the Gurdwara, the Sikh temple network, um, tried to understand the situation and support the victim by providing childcare services and education and to help the woman get back on her feet. But you contrast that with the Hong Kong situation where there's such a tight-knit community of Sikhs because it's quite a small population that one of the victims concerned was thrown out of the temple and asked not to come back. And this was when she went there at 2 in the morning with her baby on a cold winter night in Hong Kong. So um, work needs to be done uh, to, with religious leaders as well um, to advise them that victims may be coming to them for help. And they can be a tremendous source of support uh, and a resource, um, but perhaps there's some peer counseling and training that is required there so that there's a gradual trickle-down effect um, uh, to the community as a whole. So you can go from victim blaming to more supportive measures with uh, by drawing on the community network, but you can't do it prematurely. Uh, otherwise, there are great risks associated with that. Um, so what are some of the best practices then? Uh, in Australia, you see a case management system which encourages a one-stop shop service. There is also the no wrong door policy. So in effect, all organizations uh, are knowledgeable and equipped with 
information about what do you do when you have a victim of domestic violence at your door. So it's not to say, well, we don't provide these services, or we are not a shelter. It's to say, oh, I, I see what you mean. Uh, these are the things you can do, and this is how we can help. And then you develop a case referral method, and you work closely with other agencies in order to ensure that the transitioning is smooth and the victim is well taken care of. And so you prevent the drop-off that we see, uh, or the high rates of attrition. So you need an, a regular and effective and concrete um, set of practices uh, to build your one-stop shop. Uh, so agencies can work together uh, and collaborate and have a multicultural liaison network, um, which includes the public health professionals, child support uh, services, uh, counselors, uh, police officers, um, so that there can be risk assessment um, and an impact assessment of domestic violence on the situation of that woman concerned. So you look at her um, culturally and linguistically diverse needs. Um, you look at the cultural background. You look at um, what her childcare needs may be, um, mental and physical health, um, escort opportunities if she needs to go to court or access social services, legal advice, housing, financial assistance. And then you have regular follow-up um, after you devise a tailor-made safety plan. So this directly debunks the one-size-fits-all approach that we have. And so mainstreaming services is not the answer. It's actually about diversity mainstreaming, right? So you tailor services to provide targeted intervention that is relevant and suited to that particular woman's circumstances. And so gradually, victims develop trust, comfort, and they don't have to recount their stories multiple times. I mean, that's one of the things that the women in the interview shared, that every time they went somewhere, they had to tell their ordeal all over again. And it's very frustrating, has significant psychological and mental health costs, uh, and it doesn't need to be done that way. So how about getting everyone in one room uh, or recording it, have a systematic case intake system, um, which is then fed into a database so that everybody can pull up the relevant information and know that she had an appointment with the police on this date, and this was the outcome of that meeting, um, this is what the lawyer's doing, this is what um, you know the education status of the children is, uh, so that all that information is, is ready to be pulled up. For the agencies then, and the service providers, they can develop an understanding and expertise gradually of groups of women from this background, and develop a more sustainable approach to, to catering uh, to the needs of this group of women. So the specialist agencies in the UK have managed to be innovative um, in, in developing uh, ways of sharing information and raising awareness about uh, domestic violence in the community. Uh, they also have staff from a similar background. They have a good relationship with community and religious leaders. And so there's a strong trust and community network. And there's not this desire to hide, um, you know, we shouldn't share with the Hong Kong Chinese service providers because they will think badly about our community, right? So you need to ensure that there's a medium of communication and uh, an effective catering of the needs of all groups uh, to educate them about how to handle uh, cases of this sort. So they felt, many women who went to specialist shelters felt empowered and they felt well supported and the environment was accessible to them. In Hong Kong, we have a successful example of one service provider that deals with uh, drug abusers who are also perpetrators of domestic violence. Uh, and the um, the agency is not specialized in dealing with domestic violence victims, but encouraged the women to share their stories. And they worked then together with the men to develop a very specific rehabilitation program. And so this was uh, targeted at Nepalese men. And the service provider had Nepalese staff. And they worked very closely with their religious leaders as well um, to ensure that the men were able to direct their energies towards learning about the reasons for their substance abuse, their aggression, and why they hit their women. Uh, and eventually, um, they also developed a mentorship program called the Big Brothers Program, um, where the men then ended up successfully rehabilitated. So it's a very structured and specific response that resonated with the group that was the target of that intervention.
Generalist service providers uh, often lament that they found it difficult to change ethnic minority victims' mindsets. Um, but that's the problem, that you're seeking to change them uh, rather than understanding them and their needs first and trying to address them uh, as entitled to their cultural uh, value system. Um, so cognitive reframing uh, may be more desirable by exposing them and helping them develop mentorship relationships with others rather than trying to change them or force them to embrace particular uh, options. So there's a need to debunk misunderstandings and stereotypes. You don't assume that not everybody uh, you don't assume that everybody knows where to go and what to do. You need to explain procedures and ensure the competence of the people you're referring them to before you refer them to those service providers. Um, you also should be sensitive to cultural stigma and pressure, not assume that certain actions are standard or basic or a must if they want to be helped. You don't vilify and accuse the women of being responsible for their own situation. You don't accuse or vilify women for being part of a culture that is old-fashioned. Um, but you try to empower them and inform them and explain to them why domestic violence could be a problem in the longer term if action is not taken. Um, so one of the things that was particularly interesting to me was um, Australian service providers often talked about ethnic minority or called women, as they call them. Uh, they talked about them not being resistant or reluctant, but talked about them being not ready. She's not ready to separate yet. She's not ready for this particular option. And that language itself was very refreshing because it showed that they understood, right? And that's the first step towards devising, empowering um, interventions for the women. So resource allocation is another big issue, and I'm not going to delve into it in great depth, but clearly um, programs for violence against women are under budgeted. They're not targeted. They're not specific. There's a general fund that is just allocated, and then service providers can allocate how much ever of that chunk of money to domestic violence services. In Hong Kong, it's a particular problem because actually agencies are competing with each other, and they're all providing similar services, which means that they can all only do very little for each group of women that goes to them. And there's a need to centralize the funds so that they all are used to devise a comprehensive system to treat um, this issue more effectively. This piecemeal approach undermines the very, uh, the very calling uh, of many of the people who are trying to do something here effectively but simply don't have the resources to do so. You can man an entire enterprise and have a systemic and institutionalized process to provide assistance for domestic violence victims if you don't spread the resources out in the manner that the Hong Kong system forces um, the agencies to. It's also important to recognize that there are intergroup differences. There is different uh, levels of cultural acceptance towards the use of violence and help-seeking behavior. So not everybody is against uh, you know, divorce or separation. Uh, there are lots of variations, and we should explore those and understand those. There's also differences within groups themselves in terms of level of education, dependency, um, their social connection and financial resources um, and independence. And there are also numerous options. So there's different service needs, and it should always be the woman's choice. And our job is to ensure that they have options open to them. Right? So ethnic minority groups are also not homogenous. Uh, they come from various backgrounds and have different needs. So one thing I found is the more educated and financially independent ethnic minority victims of violence in Hong Kong, they did not want specialized shelters. The same goes for the women in the UK and Australia. They wanted to go to the general service providers because their value systems were different. They were second or third generation in Australia and the UK. They understood the local culture and they wanted to be treated in that manner. And you know, religious values, cultural values, they had distanced themselves from those frameworks uh, for some time now. So again, it comes down to variety and choice and realizing not one system may suit all ethnic minority women, that among us also we have different um, desires uh, for intervention. So general laws tend to fail to adequately protect the interests of all groups of women um, because violence, and as I've said, responses to it are culturally constructed. 
The combination of circumstances that are created and reinforced by the justice and the service provision system further exacerbates the impact of the violence they suffer and often incapacitates them rather than empowers them uh, to take necessary action to protect themselves. If we're serious about substantive equal protection against violence against women for all groups, then states need to structure and implement measures to take into account the individual capacities and needs uh, of specific user groups. An intersectional analysis and assessment um, tool needs to be devised to understand the strengths and capacities of individual service users um, so that you can map out a more effective response plan to domestic violence. And to achieve this, you need to raise awareness about cultural framing of violence, um, about law enforcement, the legal system, and the processes, service usage. We need data that is disaggregated. How many people from a particular background are calling the police? How many people who experience violence are not calling the police? How many people who visit health clinics are spotted and screened as victims of violence? Right? How many nurses, when doing triage, realize that the wounds or the injuries are actually resulted, uh, result from violence um, in the intimate context? So what are the practical barriers? And identification is one of the foremost ones, because we know that there is under-reporting because of the self or the, you know, the self-initiated process that is required in order to set the ball in motion. Findings from multiple studies confirm that women of color and immigrant women have different needs and they're more vulnerable to becoming entrenched in these situations and that their responses are informed by their intersecting identities and capacities, such as language, financial independence, family situation, immigration, just to name a few. And to deal with this group effectively, we need to review the existing measures to thoroughly understand the essence of domestic violence and how it impacts them. What are the relevant disempowering factors? And then how can we proceed from that to empower them? So I suggest a two-pronged approach. The first is to enhance victims' capacities for help seeking. And the second is to enhance law as well as policy and the capacity of frontline agencies and responders to protect uh, and offer services to this group more effectively. In terms of the first, you need to raise awareness about existing laws and frameworks among the women concerned, including those who are non-victims. As we saw, non-victims uh, from ethnic minority and immigrant backgrounds have particular perceptions that also need to be corrected. Raise awareness about the services and their status and entitlement as holders of particular rights. To note perceptions that they have about legal systems and their confidence in the processes and try to correct the misperceptions or uh, misunderstandings that they have. Likewise, we need to raise awareness about the remedies that are available, the short and long-term remedies, the costs involved, uh, and the availability of legal aid and advice across the group. Um, we need to empower the women also to eradicate some of those initial factors that make them more vulnerable, like their immigration status could be improved um, by effecting a rule uh, such as the domestic violence consideration rule. Their financial independence and literacy can be enhanced uh, when they arrive in Hong Kong so that when faced with such a situation, they're not as vulnerable as they would be without this. There's also a significant role for peer education uh, about violence so that they can teach each other and be stronger support networks rather than being isolated rather than engaging in gossip or isolating each other as a result of stigma and shame. Service providers' impressions um, need to be addressed and corrected, particularly in light of the perceived prejudice and racism uh, highlighted in some of the cases. Um, there's a need to raise awareness also about um, the remedies available to tackle violence and to think think more laterally to incorporate diverse interventions uh, for the short term and long term, and also how to generate um, an appropriate response plan um, to tackle the needs of specific women, to ask for a budget that, that focuses on DV interventions specifically. They also need to take a positive rights-based approach to service provision by conditioning assistance on the basis of victims taking your preferred advice that's um, not part of the ethics of effective service provision. There's also a need to train uh, in cultural sensitivity, ethics, confidentiality, um, 
also f not only for social workers, but also for interpreters. So we need a more rigorous accreditation program before allowing people to stand as third parties in these sensitive contexts. We also need to create more culturally viable and uh, responsive support systems and solutions. Frontline officers, including police and healthcare uh, professionals need also to be trained in identifying victims of violence and understanding to devise a suitable uh, strategy and response plan. There needs to be a formalized coordination between and across agencies to build trust and limit the impact of repeat trauma that is caused by telling your story over and over again to different people. This would also help coordinate responses uh, and prevent women from falling through the gaps more effectively. Courts, there's a role to be played, I think, um, in terms of legal professionals as well. Lawyers have failed to understand specifically the needs uh, and the entitlements of wives or women who are victims of domestic violence, and when they want the custody of their children, domestic violence is often downplayed. In fact, the case I referred to earlier, the woman was advised by her lawyers not to mention domestic violence at all, because she said that the judge would see that as a tactical move uh, that she's making to undermine the case of her opponent. Uh, and that is indeed what happened. The judge accused her of raising this as a strategic way to um, take custody of the child. So this needs to be uh, addressed because it's a significant uh, concern if courts are prejudiced against victims of violence. Um, we need to compare whether generalized or specialized service providers fare better uh, for particular groups of victims. And so there needs to be comprehensive data intake and tracking and evaluation. Research data will provide invaluable insights into how cases can be more effectively managed. So we need to develop not only a victim typology and impact assessment tool, but also in, enhance our data collection and screening processes at first ports of call so that we can move towards a one-stop shop paradigm and we can enhance interdisciplinary cooperation to build on our knowledge and expertise and eventually provide specialized services um, so that we can empower women so that they can all enjoy their equal rights um, as effectively as everybody else. Thank you. We've got time for questions, and I'm happy to, to take them if you have any. Yes. Hi, right? Hello. Uh, I have a question. As we all know, uh, there are more and more refugees around the world recently. And in Hong Kong, there are about 10,000 uh, refugees also. So uh, what, uh, or more accurately, they are asylum seekers or protection claimants. So what can they do, especially for women and children? if they encounter domestic violence under the existing system in Hong Kong or UK? OK, thank you. Well, even if they're asylum seekers and refugees, yeah. they are entitled to protection against domestic violence. Um, so they should access um, shelters. And if they need a, a space to stay, they should do so. Uh, and uh -huh. they cannot be told that they're not entitled to, to stay there. OK. Uh, uh, what happens if their maybe their husband, uh, if they uh, uh, come to the court and 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 make a judgment to their husband? What if, because they are legal illegal, legally speaking, they are overstayer. What hap will happen to their husband? Well, if they are all refugees, then yeah. presumably their status is the same, and each of their cases will be considered on an individual basis. Um, so if, if the husband is a refugee but has, found, has been found to have violated the law of Hong Kong, then he would be dealt with like any other person who has um, violated Hong Kong law. So he would face the punishment, and it wouldn't uh, impact the evaluation of his application to be an asylum seeker, because those considerations are different, right? Because Hong Kong doesn't, um, we receive refugees, but we don't settle refugees here, um, yeah. we would not look at their fitness to integrate into our society, right? So I think the legal remedies would still be distinct and separate, and the asylum application would be separate. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. 
Do you want to um, come and use one of the mics, please? Yeah. Thanks. Um, so I'll treat your, I'll take your second question first, and that is the rehabilitation programs. So Hong Kong's courts tried a pilot program, which was the Batterers Intervention Program. Uh, and the idea was to recognize that um, perpetrators of violence also are uh, dealing with some personal issues. They have aggression, uh, and so it's, it's a health-related issue that they need to work on in order to... Um, redirect their energy uh, more effectively. And so they learn to deal with um, their anger and aggression. Uh, and that model uh, is one which uh, you know, has been practiced worldwide, and it's been called cognitive behavioral therapy. So you, change, you work with the perpetrator to change their mindset and their thinking about their role in the home and whether they're entitled to violence. So you, will, you would have to sensitize it based on the background of the perpetrator. If they think that you know, this is their right and they can beat their wives, then you'll need to work on that as well. Um, it's not, uh, it's something that is difficult to enforce because, as you know, uh, it's not easy to change people's minds. So for some uh, communities, um, it's been hard to incentivize uh, the perpetrator to seek assistance, to seek counseling, right? Because they don't feel they need it. Um, and so that's where the court comes in. If you make an order that you have to undergo six months of CBT, then you go through the program. Um, but what has emerged in countries like Australia, which have been doing this for several years, is that you can't, again, you can't take a one-size-fits-all approach. Whatever you design for a therapy program uh, for Australian men who are batterers would not be effective for minority men. And so you need to devise a, a more culturally relevant program for them because they have a different system uh, a value system that dictates how they perceive their manhood, their role, uh, and you know how they would respond to this kind of a punishment. Um, the response has been mixed. Some men are they value this opportunity to work on themselves. They want to genuinely improve because they want to save their relationship. And then you have those men who who don't respond so well, and when they finish the program, they become more aggressive. So it can go both ways, uh, and you have to be able to plan accordingly and anticipate the responses. And so sometimes it's possible to go back to court and ask him to stay in the program longer. Um, but again, you know, I think we're still at an early stage around the world. There's not been comprehensive studies done uh, to determine what is the level of risk if you have a non, uh, you know, a, perform, uh, a perpetrator who doesn't want to undergo this program, who's forced to go through it. Does it make the situation much worse? So we do need to assess and evaluate. In Hong Kong, the difficulty is we have no culturally relevant programs. So even for offenders of certain offenses, uh, even though the court could uh, rule, for example, drug traffickers. Sometimes they have a substance abuse problem, and that is why they are traffickers. Um, but there is no suitable um, cognitive behavioral therapy program for them, uh, and so the courts often give them a, a, a prison sentence. And this has been flagged as un unfortunate, because why would you send someone to jail who you think really needs help? Um, and, and the answer is, well, there's no suitable program for them. So there's a great deal of work uh, in the healthcare sector that can be done on this. And in fact, that's going to be the focus of a presentation we're doing. So there's an all-day seminar on the 24th of October looking at cross-cultural uh, interventions in addition to cognitive behavioral therapy. 
On your other question on preventive measures, absolutely. Uh, I said at the beginning of the presentation, perhaps um, you, you weren't here, uh, then we talked about how there need to be, I mean, the states have a, an obligation, due diligence obligation that goes right from the prevention to protection measures uh, to punishment, so prosecution, punishment, and then providing reparations to the victims as well. So prevention is is just as important. And in the UK, for example, um, you know, leaflets are handed out or videos are played on the flight uh, as people you know come and go, so that women might learn that they're you know this is domestic violence, this is not acceptable, and these are the things you can do if you become a victim. That is not happening as much in Hong Kong. So outreach work is very very important. Um, at the moment, we do have, I mean, the Social Welfare Department has leaflets in a number of languages. I've seen them online. I don't know if they're available in hard copy. Uh, you know, and it's there in Hindi, Punjabi, Nepalese. But how many of us knew that? I didn't know that until I've done this research, right? So how many people actually are aware of the resources? Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. You need to press the button, please. Most of the... Um um, giving the help. So most of the stuff goes through the volunteering. And uh, I, I hear that you suggested that one of the first um, um, social workers from the ethnic com ethnic minority communities is, is just there. Uh, so I want to say if there has been any um, efforts taken from the government side to um, reach out to the ethnic minority communities to seek volunteers and to um, make them legal, so to say, and say that we really need you. Uh, because there are tons of volunteers like us who, who work with, with the victims and with the survivors. It's just that we don't take that extra step to become legal uh, social workers. Um, and so I don't know if there are any incentives. I mean, I've been working for a long time in the US, but I was there as a student. And so I don't know if there are any incentives from the government to, to for us to do that. And if there are, then like is is there um, are those you know advertised properly? Um, if you are here as a, on on say a job or as a student, then why would I want to go in for that extra sixty hour training? Like what is in there for me apart from being just a good humanitarian? You know, unless I am a Hong Kong citizen, so to say. So is there a provision? Um, if I am not a citizen here, to still become a legal social worker, and if there is, which there might be, then um, is there is is it um, is that information given to the ethnic minority community so, uh, volunteer workers already who are doing that work? And if there is, then how is it that we reach out to those volunteers so that they can become legal social workers, and then we can bridge that gap? So I think that there are several layers to the question that you asked, uh, and what you're talking about, I think, um, uh, has to be tackled in, in, in the relevant dimension. So first of all, the general Hong Kong ethnic minority population that is resident here, that have the legal status to work. Um, a report I released last week showed that uh, our children uh, have a slow start in school, that we're less likely to uh, have higher education opportunities because um, the system is designed in a way that we're not able to access higher education because of the Chinese language um, barrier. Um, the report also showed, therefore, that we tend not to be professionals and are mostly concentrated in the more manual uh, labor profession. Um, jobs or occupations. Uh, and so there's actually a cycle, right? So if you don't start off right, you don't end up right. Uh, and that is a systemic issue which um, the government is well aware of and is now working to tackle to at least address the education component of it. But that explains why there have not in recent years been any ethnic minorities who have even been able to access higher degree programs related to social work. The one social worker I mentioned, his course was substantially taught in Chinese. Uh, and he was, I mean, he's fluent in spoken Cantonese, but he faced a great deal of difficulties in written, uh, uh, written Chinese. And you can imagine how challenging it must have been for him to qualify. It was an extremely difficult task, uh, but he was just so adamant uh, that he did that. So, you know, there is recognition that it's not that there is a lack of interest or awareness. There's a systemic uh, barrier 
to even gaining the level of qualification that's required. And you need the degree in order to register as a social worker in Hong Kong. So there is a formality uh, as to whether overseas social workers qualified elsewhere can register with the board. I'm not sure about the social work registration uh, rules, um, but I'm sure that there must be some way of doing it by doing um, either a conversion exam or uh, some degree of um, apprenticeship or volunteering. But again, I'm not an expert on social work qualifications. I can't speak to that. Uh, on the volunteer front, um, people who are in Hong Kong uh, unfortunately can't even volunteer if, they're, if they don't have the right visa status. So the government has a great deal of restrictions, and this has been a debate uh, you know, ongoing in the you know, NGO sector for years about how restrictive it is. And you might have good people, but you can't match them with the opportunities because they're not allowed. And so you have to have sponsorship from the organization you're working with. And that disincentivizes volunteers, or I mean, because it's illegal. So you don't want to be uh, acting uh, against the law. So that's a difficulty there. And that's something that the government should be encouraged um, to, to open up um, with respect to. In terms of um, opportunities and whether the government is looking for people like us, they are uh, in some sectors. So in recent years, the police department, for example, came up with a liaison, community liaison officer scheme, which was designed to attract ethnic minority youth to be the liaison between young ethnic minorities who are getting into trouble with the law uh, and the police force and to bridge the gap. And so under the first year, five such officers were appointed. And the scheme continues, and I understand that there are now 15 such officers in Hong Kong working in the districts where there are high uh, ethnic minority populations. So I think things are being done. But what isn't, what isn't happening is, is a global or macro level view um, you know, there's no uh, macro level view as to, well, all of these changes need to happen across the board, across different sectors, not just police, not just social work, but, you know, even in education, for example, studies show having an ethnic minority teaching assistant in the classroom helps ethnic minority children learn better. So there's things you know, but they're not being implemented. Um, and, and so there's a there's a need to get our voices together, perhaps, and propose. And that's where you know, discussion about best, best practices is important. It's good to draw on international best practices and say, hey, this is working there. Why aren't we doing it here? But we're too busy in Hong Kong uh, doing the work that we need to do, that we don't have the time to come out and say, oh, these are solutions. You know, we should think about them. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the very comprehensive presentation. I particularly like the slide about uh, service provider having ethnic minority staffs and working, uh, doing a very good work. Um, and also, I, I, I also like the uh, recommendation of one stop service. Uh, I come from Nepalese community, and I'm actually the student in the Faculty of Education here. Uh, and in my experience, I've seen that many of the service providers, they have employed some EM staffs, but uh, it's it's same in the schools, so they, they would like to employ some EM staffs. But it seems that uh, they just want to employ as a showpiece in the low positions. And many of these uh, frontline, I mean, low position, uh, I mean, EM workers, uh, when I meet them, they always complain that the meetings and, and all those uh, discussions that are mostly held in Chinese language and Sine staffs are very, uh, I mean, not, not very willing to listen to their views and uh, experience and opinion. And I was just wondering how uh, uh, this, uh, I mean, the, how the one stop service and how effective uh, service provisions uh, would be possible uh, without having these staffs uh, or, or without having uh, the people in the senior positions or without having the uh, effective communication in, in these uh, service for providing agencies. Thank you. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think that um, the unfortunate thing was, for me at least, uh, I when I went to interview people, the social workers at the organization 
they were invariably, uh, you know, local Chinese uh, men and women who uh, who were in charge of the case concerned. But they had a liaison officer who was an ethnic minority uh, person. Um, and when I asked about the division of labor, what I understood was a lot of the communication and the advising was being done by the ethnic min minority member of staff. Uh, but because they were not a social worker who was qualified and registered, there were certain things that they were not able to do or entitled to do. Um, and so this created, again, a, a gap between uh, what the minority women were hearing and then what they heard when the Chinese social worker would liaise with them. Uh, and they, there was a lot of confusion and uncertainty sometimes about their entitlements because ethnic minority staff would tell them one thing and for some reason the social worker would put it differently. Um, and this is where, I mean, it could be communication, it could be the hierarchy that you talked about, um, and, and particularly the environment, the work environment. I think you're absolutely right, uh, where you have issues uh, that impact ethnic minority lives. Uh, ethnic minorities may be the experts in that situation. So you need to um, create an appropriate platform for them to share their expertise and knowledge uh, so that you can co-develop appropriate solutions. In terms of uh, one-stop shop, the UK and Australian examples show you cannot do that effectively if you do not have a diverse staff. You have to have people of different backgrounds at the organization so that you don't have to keep finding people from outside to help you with this and help you with that. You need in-house expertise, and that comes from ethnic minorities. The barrier in Hong Kong is this um, education system where if you can't qualify, then you may not be eligible to be appointed as a member of staff at a certain level or grade. As you know, many NGOs uh, are subvented by government or have these governance structures, and you, you, know, you have to be a qualified social worker. Uh, so it's this vicious cycle, which we're all, I mean, we've talked about this extensively. We know that this is um, part of the problem. And the question is, is there room to change the eligibility criteria for now until Hong Kong's education system catches up so that we have more qualified ethnic minority social workers who can then you know, be a part of the organization, but in the meantime, still lend their expertise as equal members who, uh, who know about the situation and the problem and can give culturally relevant advice. So that's a very, very important um, component of it. I think um, it is important, however, to start identifying. I think the, 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 the impression seems to be that there aren't enough people from the minority community who are interested. Uh, who believe in uh, these types of rights and services for women. Um, there's too much emphasis on the cultural values. We don't talk about our problems. I don't think that's a correct representation of Hong Kong's ethnic minority community. I actually think there is evidence now that many of them are open. They believe in women's rights. They want to empower their communities. But there's no venue uh, for them to do so. So we need to start with identifying the pool and then matching them with the um, vacancies by creating uh, or talking about creating one-stop shops at least. Yeah. Yes, Amod. OK, thank you. Yeah, as Mr. Tava mentioned, you know, it's, it's very comprehensive and classified information. And it's a great idea. And going back to again, so are we recommending this to the government or those the policy maker? So how it is a way to make it possibilities. <clears throat> That's my main concern, how we can do. Like, if we see those like a district councillor or the lawmakers who are working closely with the ethnic minorities or the department, I think they have no idea at all how it is going. But I think this we are just keeping within the scholars or within our group. So how we can take this to the particular people who can implement this policy so it can go to the action. So that's. I think what we have to look. Thank you, Amod. And I'm really pleased that you asked that because um, earlier this year there was a hearing in Lechko um, in the Social Welfare uh, Services panel which talked about domestic violence and sexual violence. And I made a deputation there and talked about this situation. Uh, and for many years I've been doing this uh, study. The government has asked me, where's the evidence? Uh, as the government always asks, where is the evidence that ethnic minority women are suffering and not receiving the help that they need? And so we now have some evidence at least to say that there is a problem uh, and it can be addressed through the Hong Kong system. Um, and at that presentation, I also said that 
at that time, I only had three minutes to talk about this whole uh, issue. And as you've seen, it took me one hour, 40 minutes to get through everything. Um, and so very kindly, Mr. Fernando Chung, the legislator um, who uh, chairs that panel, he agreed to have a separate session on ethnic minorities issues relating to domestic and sexual violence. And on Tuesday, the 6th of October, this panel will be taking place at 1045 at Lechco. It's an open panel, open to the public, so you're very welcome to attend. And I will still only have three minutes to talk about this, but others of our um, service providers and professionals who are in the room, they're also going to be there and talk about ethnic minority women's needs uh, on this front. And I would encourage you to engage with that process as well. Uh, and it's so important to have visibility, to show that we are concerned, and these are relevant issues, and we'd like to have a say. So thank you for your question, and I hope you'll be there on Tuesday. If you need more information, I'm happy to give it to you. Yeah. You had a question. Yeah. Yes, I did. I am from Australia. Thank you for including us. And I did work in a, a one-stop shop, which is also a specialist service for culled women, culturally and linguistically diverse. So this is very relevant to my um, background. Um, I've just got a quick comment, but then a question, um, just leading on to what, from what this gentleman said. In the Australian context, you don't have to be a social worker. Um, in order to work with victims of family violence, you can be a caseworker, a bilingual caseworker. I don't know if this is a model that's useful for Hong Kong, but it's one we use, and we really have found great benefit having bilingual caseworkers work with social workers um, collaboratively to support these women and give them um, culturally competent advice and services. Um, but in terms of my question, I noted that you um, found social workers had uh, a lack of legal understanding. Um, one of the challenges we have had in Australia is that the social workers think they've got a very good legal understanding and legal knowledge, but it's not exactly accurate. So one of our challenges, and I have a legal background, is um, assisting them to realise how the law actually works and its complexity. Um, but that's sometimes difficult because they feel they already have the knowledge. Is that something you found in the research and do you have any ideas around working through that challenge? I think as many of my law students tell me as well when they come to study law, that their impressions of how the law works is very different from how the law actually works in practice. And those of us who have worked uh, in the field uh, know that often it's very hard to navigate uh, the system, even having all the legal knowledge and the dangers of having the wrong knowledge um, and seeking to apply that in this kind of a context is particularly problematic. I think in terms of... Um, what I found in Hong Kong, I certainly found that there was a, a, a grave degree of um, misunderstandings about the legal system and victims were being advised, uh, I mean, in a, in a manner that was detrimental to their case and therefore they couldn't get the solutions they wanted and they couldn't realize the rights that that were actually theirs. Uh, so they were being told all kinds of things about their entitlements, their eligibility, and I, I found that very sad because you know these are people's lives. Uh, they they are human beings, and you know, and as women, um, they particularly uh, you know likely to to be undermined by the system and this lack of knowledge. And I think it's incumbent on, on all of us who are working in the field to ensure that our knowledge is up to scratch. And that cannot be done apart from uh, you know, having regular opportunities for training and interaction with those in the field, um, but also sharing. And that's where I think um, you know, Australia, again, is, is a wonderful model because not only did I learn that they have these multidisciplinary case conferences regularly for each case, uh, but they also have these three monthly and six monthly conferences uh, around you know getting all the relevant social workers uh, and caseworkers from Australia to come at one you know in one place to then talk about um, best practices uh, so there's constant knowledge generation and trying to understand and nobody claims to be an expert because they all know they're going to face new challenges and they want to constantly try to improve um, the problem is in Hong Kong like for example for years I was talking about cultural sensitivity and somewhere that idea clicked and the government said right let's do cultural sensitivity and we'll do it in-house and there's a sense of oh well we've arrived we've done it now <laughs> and and so that's it we don't need to do any more but you know in the service sector there's always more to do you know there's no perfect system and we should certainly um, you know improve um, uh, legal knowledge uh, and 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 get this get some clarity I think there's also uncertainties the system is 
It's flexible, but that also creates uncertainties, and people don't know always what the answer is. So what I'm hoping to do is, after working with uh, some of the people in this room, I hope to come up with a flow diagram to try to simplify and understand myself uh, from you know, other experts. Uh, well, what's the process? How do you navigate the system? Uh, can it be you know, effectively represented in a chart or something? Um, on your other point about EM caseworkers, that's what we have in Hong Kong too. We do have ethnic minority caseworkers. But as Amod said, and as this gentleman said, um, their role is, is mostly subordinate. For, for no apparent reason other than the fact that they don't possess social work um, qualifications or they're not registered in Hong Kong as social workers. There have been social workers who are qualified in India or Pakistan, but they can't um, exercise their expertise here um, because of the system. So that's something that needs to be addressed. And the question is, is there good reason to keep that talent pool out? Uh, just like to that, uh, you know, your question, is there good reason to keep out the volunteers, the people who want to do good? You know, why, why stop them? Uh, and the government hasn't really thought of a good answer to that, except for, oh, it's too risky because they might abuse, uh, you know, the system. Um, you had a question earlier? Hi, um, thank you. Uh, as you mentioned before, that the EM case about not knowing the rights and the um, and the things about laws. How would you recommend the people of social service or any people who knows about laws that to pass the knowledge to the people who don't know about the laws and rights of their own? Because I can see that EM, like as you mentioned, ethnic minorities people doesn't really know about the laws and rights they have, and they have always stepped back and not stepped front. So how would you pass the knowledge and recommend anyone to pass the knowledge to the EMs? <laughs> Thank One you. of the things I learned uh, in the study, because it wasn't easy to identify victims who were willing to talk, and one of the things I learned is that women uh, are very concerned or interested in certain issues. If you talk about education or if you have a seminar on health needs of women, they're more likely to come. So one of the ways in which I found some women was I said, this is a health talk about South Asian women. Uh, and they came along, and then we talked about, you know, the health needs of ethnic minority women, and we then talked about violence. So the hardest part is often getting them interested, um, because if you say this is a talk about domestic violence in, you know, Indian, Muslim, Nepalese families, nobody wants to come, because they're worried about the associations or the implications, the stigma, if you show up for something like that. But if you, you know, talk about it differently, when you have the women in the same room, they're all happy to talk about anything because, as I said, a lot of them are very open, have some excellent ideas. So one of the women I interviewed, she said, I said, oh, well, what would you do if somebody, if your neighbor told you her husband was beating her? She said, I would gather all my friends and go back and beat him, uh, you know, as, as a group. <laughs> and, there, you know, the conversation shifted. So, for example, in India, you have the pink gang right, the Gulabi gang, there was a movie made recently, where because the law was uh, failing to effectively tackle the situation, I don't advocate this, but the women got together and, you know, uh, went to the perpetrator's house and said, you're not going to beat her again, otherwise we'll beat you, right? I think, uh, she is a student, I think on our view that as a student, you know, they are not getting all this education in the Hong Kong education system, so how they can able to access this kind of information, why it's not included in the curriculum or the way uh, again, I think it comes down to um, the teachers and the government's uh, stipulations for what comes in the curriculum. I mean, even in terms of raising awareness among the Chinese community about domestic violence, took many, many years to persuade the government that they need to have uh, relevant um, pamphlets and outreach work. But what has the government done? They have these pub, uh, announcements, you know, you have a two-minute or one-minute ad on TV. Uh, what are the chances that you're going to catch that, uh, you know, advertisement about domestic violence? Um, so I think it, it comes down to maybe individual teachers and parents, I think, to educate uh, their children that it is not right if a man hits you. Uh, and, you know, there are things that can be done about it. Ultimately, Amod, many of the answers to your questions, for me at least, seem to be, you know, it's up to us, and we need to do something, because if you wait for the government, who knows, <laughs> you know? Yes? 
No, have you pressed the button? Hello, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Jopa, for your presentation. I would um, I'm just wondered for your obs uh, for the self raised score for your observation regarding uh, is there any difference between uh, in terms of ethnicity uh, among your interviewees uh, you interviewed? I mean, is there, is there any is the ethnicity affect the self raised scores for your research? You mean, is there any difference between uh, the self-rating scores of different ethnic groups? Yes, as um, as, as, much as an independent variable, you will, will, it, will it become an independent, uh, independent variable to affect the self-score they rated? Interestingly, I found that it's not ethnicity. It was actually education and financial independence. Those were the variables that created uh, the difference in terms of their understanding of violence and their willingness to do something. So clearly there's a, an argument to be made that the more educated you are and the more financially independent you are, the more likely that you will think that domestic violence is wrong and that you will have some courage to do something. But on the other hand, I did have a case where a woman who was quite senior um, and educated um, and financially independent, she refused to seek help because she's worried about cultural stigma and shame in the family. So there's no fixed um, predictor, but these are variables we can think about. And as I said, this is a qualitative study. So I'm a little uh, hesitant to say this variable is, uh, is you know, a reliable variable or determinant, but I think we need to um, study further. Um, but it seems to me that education or literacy is one of the uh, likely predictors of a lack of response and an unwillingness to engage with the system. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Thank you again for the presentation. Uh, just out of interest, how many years have you been doing this research project and is there a next step? So um, the research uh, was conducted between 2011 and 2013. Um, uh, and the next step is, as I've said, to apply for a bigger grant, because this is a very small uh, project that was funded by um, just, I think it was only 40,000 Hong Kong dollars. Uh, and so some of the data was difficult to collect, especially since it's overseas, uh, and uh, I wasn't able to use the funds to, to go overseas. Um, but the idea is to apply for a more comprehensive study to, um, and to involve service providers in Hong Kong. One of the things I've learned and um, the, the kind of, um, now that people know that I'm doing this work, I think they're also interested in similar questions and trying to understand how they can overcome the challenges they face in their work. Um, so it would be important to partner with um, service organizations so that they can share the data more willingly to understand what are the patterns. So the next step is to study more comprehensively uh, each of these questions so that we can have quantitative data looking at variables that impact help-seeking behaviors uh, and to also brainstorm the prospects of setting up this kind of a one-stop shop in Hong Kong. It's something very new that hasn't been done, but it would be useful to do an impact assessment to see if this is something that the sector wants or that the sector thinks would be useful. Yeah. Yes. Hi, um, I have two questions. So first of all, um, you mentioned that one of the one of the solutions towards um, combating the stigma surrounding women, um, I think minority women seeking help is um, more social integration. But um, how would you suggest that you actually go about that? Because, um, like you said, when you put when you put um, women of different races um, women of different races under under one shelter, it creates problems. So how? Like realistically, how, um, like, what methods of social integration would you recommend? And also the second one, which is more personal, like, what, um, well, what made you the most? What was the biggest factor that made you interested in this issue? Was it your upbringing or something that you witnessed? 
On the first question, I think social integration is not something that should only happen in a piecemeal fashion when we have a problem. I think just in general, Hong Kong doesn't have an effective mechanism to integrate those who are newly arriving into Hong, Kong way, Hong Kong's life. Um, we don't realize that the people who are coming in have certain uh, talents like music or uh, fabrics or um, you know art. Uh, and there are many ways in which we can actually centralize them uh, to interact with the local community so that we can learn more about each other. So having community spaces where ethnic minorities can interact with their Chinese counterparts would be a good start where your children can play together uh, or kids can go um, you know, to, to school together. Uh, so we know that that uh, is something that is not happening uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, I think um, apart from shelters, it's important to recognize that women themselves um, can probably be productive. So many of these women are excellent cooks, uh, and as I've said, they are probably, I mean, many of them are really good at stitching garments and um, artwork. How about creating a social enterprise, giving them something to do so that they can empower themselves financially or maybe using that forum to educate them, you know, teach them something about Hong Kong or Chinese culture, uh, you know, share um, those kind of talents. Uh, that is something that can happen um, more rather than just having a shelter that you are in, a, in trouble and that's why we put you here, but what do you do there? You're busy just visiting social workers and the hospital and, you know, but I think providing some activity for them to, to, to empower them would be me more meaningful. Um, uh, in, in one of the studies I've done on citizenship education in a, in a country in Europe, this is how they integrate um, immigrants from other parts of Europe into their society. They have a community center where the women would go every afternoon, bring their children, the children would play together, and the women would share some skills and teach each other something else. So, you know, we don't need a lot of money for something like that, um, but those are things that haven't been explored here. Um, in terms of what motivated me, oh, I don't know where to begin. Uh, <laughs> but I think that, um, I guess, being of a minority background myself and recognizing that I have uh, the privilege of having education. And so I do not have to suffer um, in certain situations. Uh, and when I think about my counterparts, and particularly I do a lot of work on uh, women in India who experience these situations and how challenged they are because of the environment in which they're, they're stuck. Uh, but yet many of them show a great deal of resilience and strength and know how to come out of those situations. I feel it's not impossible to tackle violence even if you have a poor um, system uh, and there's systemic prejudice. I mean, India is not known for its strong legal system. I mean, we may be the largest democracy in the world, but boy, do we have, uh, you know, systemic issues and, and problems to deal with. So I thought it would be a, a meaningful contribution to the minority women here who maybe lack the voice uh, or don't know how to engage with the system. Um, and so this for me is just the beginning of trying to uh, to share um, some of their views with the larger Hong Kong community and hope that someone would find it of um, interest or of humanitarian concern and then take it further. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you very much for your sharing. Um, one point that I'm quite interested to know is that do you find if they have any cultural streams when you talk to the ladies? Cultural for, Yeah, for example, religion or like family bonding. Yes, absolutely. And so, uh, you know, there was one uh, social worker who said to me, oh, you know, um, one of my cases was a Muslim woman, and so I just assumed she would not be willing to do this or that or that. Um, and it was interesting because in my sample, I had at least uh, six Muslim women, all of whom were very powerful ladies, who said they would go back to their other friends and women, uh, and they would shame the perpetrator together. Uh, so there was, there was community solidarity. And so I don't think it's true that they all have that pressure that, oh, I want to hide this. I think some of them will derive a lot of strength from each other. In terms of faith, unfortunately in Hong Kong, I think because there's such um, small religious communities, uh, there's still a lot of patriarchy. Uh, I, I spoke to a faith leader, actually. I spoke to um, a Muslim imam, and his views were quite... Um, 
quite conservative. Uh, and so when I asked, what would you do if a woman came to you and told you she's being beaten by the husband? His first response was, I would ask her whether she is being good to her husband. Has she fulfilled all her duties as a wife? Does she, uh, you know, does she beautify herself and does she offer sex whenever he wants? So there are, you know, clearly um, some patriarchal um, and cultural uh, attitudes may um, prove to be systemically problematic for women. But on the other hand, um, there are groups which, um, so there's a, there's a Muslim group of women who said they have started a Quran reading class. They decided to reread the Quran from a, from a woman's point of view. Um, I think, you know, so it's not a religious group, it's just a group of women, but they share their religion and their interest in modernizing their religious uh, views or values. Um, in terms of whether uh, their leaders would agree with their interpretation, I don't know, because in, in, in some faiths, the men get to decide what, is the, uh, what does the Quran say. But at least for them, I learned that it's a very empowering and interesting experience. Uh, and they told me many things that they read that the imams did not tell them. So they said that when they used to go to the mosque and listen to sermons, they were always under the impression that the Quran says that the men are superior, the Quran says that the men this and that. And when they read it themselves, they learned that that's not, it's not so skewed, actually. So again, there's a great, uh, there's a great deal that can be done to, um, yeah, to facilitate dialogue among the women themselves, and they can then draw on each other's strength. Yes. Sorry, I still have some questions. That's Can I still ask them now? Yes, uh, I'm going to stop at 12.30 sharp. <laughs> oh, oh. And I want to ask, um, because you have mentioned that children is one of the concerns that prevent the, the, the woman from seeking help, and I wonder if there, there are any policies to deal with their children while they're, while they're looking for a shelter or their family is suffering from the domestic, domestic violence. And uh, the second question, maybe it's not that kind, that kind related to this, to the topic today, but because I have heard that you mentioned mainland China's situations, so I, I want to know if there are any data that show that the, the, the woman uh, who's suffering from domestic uh, domestic viol violence in mainland China. Thank you. I'll take your second question first. Um, so although the study uh, incorporated the views of mainland Chinese women who were seeking services in Hong Kong, uh, because this is not a quantitative study, I, I don't have the numbers, so I can't say that, uh, you know, most mainland women or many of them. I can't say anything like that. All I can say is that the views that I shared with you include the views of mainland Chinese women about Hong Kong's legal system, the way they think they're treated, um, the discrimination they face, uh, their fears about um, social stigma and the culture, loss of family, loss of face. So these findings are, are include um, their viewpoints. Uh, there are, however, numerous studies that have been done recently by Edward Chen, Agnes Tiwari, uh, Anna Choi, and a number of other scholars who have looked specifically at mainland Chinese women's experiences of domestic violence in Hong Kong, uh, especially after the Chen Shui Wen uh, tragedy. So there are papers out there, uh, and you can, um, they're more quantitative in nature, so they are probably more statistically reliable. Um, but I think if you ask who I would say that, um, the majority of mainland women who have a particular socioeconomic background are more likely to experience violence when they are here in Hong Kong. So there are some factors that make them more prone to risk, um, and those are factors that have been identified through the work of these scholars. Uh, you may be interested in looking at that in greater depth. Um, on the first question then, there are of course policies in Hong Kong relating to um, what is to be done with children. Uh, who come from families that experience domestic violence. And most of them are dealt with through the Integrated Family Services Center, the IFSC, which is under the Social Welfare Department. So they have a protocol which social workers and police um, and service providers are supposed to follow when they realize that there's a family violence issue and then there's a child at potential risk. Social workers would usually be required to conduct an assessment to determine whether the child is at risk. Um, in practice, 
Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how those decisions are taken, but sometimes social workers would uh, remove the child from the family home and temporarily put them in foster care uh, to ensure that the child is no longer at risk of violence. Um, but sometimes, and particularly in the cases of all the women I talked to, um, they felt that the social workers uh, did not really address their concerns about violence towards the child. So when the women said, we want to take our children with us, then the social workers would say, but you can't because the shelter has no space. Because ethnic minority families tend to have larger families. So they are usually have at least two, if not four children to go with them. And shelters cannot accommodate that number of children. Um, well, on the other hand, of course, this leaves the children vulnerable to the risk and as I said, access to the children once they, the women have left the home is often impossible because the perpetrator will use that to punish you because you complained about him. So the case I mentioned of the woman who had the eight-month-old baby, she didn't see her child again until now. And the social worker in that case did not even ask her, uh, do you know if your child has been uh, subject to violence? Do you think your child is um, at risk of violence? It is only when I became involved in the case that I asked the social worker, where's the child? And then she said, oh, with the father. And I said, is the child under risk of abuse? And oh, I will go and do an assessment now. So I don't know if that was an, in an individual incident of a failing or systematically, you know, this was not on the radar of the social worker, I don't know. But my feeling is that children are very severely neglected uh, even though there are protocols and policies, what is being done is not necessarily the best for them. Uh, many of them suffer the trauma of separation or they feel that they are torn because they have to choose one parent. So in the case that I mentioned that went to court, the mother is fighting for access to the daughter. Um, but the daughter, uh, when she is asked, who do you want to stay with? She keeps saying both. But she told the psychologist that she's afraid of the father because the father has anger management problems. But when the psychologist gave this evidence in court, the court said that the child cannot be, the child's evidence cannot be accepted because she is too young to know what she wants. So, you know, there's a mismatch there again where somebody is saying something, but you don't take it into account to make a decision that is good for that family because you either downplay the problem. You say she's a, you know, she's a victim, so she is exaggerating. Or she's a child, so she doesn't know what she wants. Um, so the question then is, well, what is the satisfactory answer? And who has the burden? If the child psychologist assessment is that the child is at risk, shouldn't that be expert enough evidence? But for some reason, the courts are not taking that into account. So there are many levels at which the issue needs to be tackled. Um, so we have a lot of work to do together. <laughs> Thank you all once again for your interest and for your questions. Uh, the report will be online uh, on CCPL's website, and I welcome you to download the full report um, sometime next week uh, to take a look. Thanks once again.